Since the very beginning of time, man has looked to the night sky and asked the same questions. Where are we? How far do the stars go? And are we alone? Today, these same questions linger in the minds of every human with an inquisitive nature. Is our world just a speck in an infinite universe, surrounded by many other worlds and species? Or is it possible that we are the only intelligent life in the universe? If our universe is truly infinite, then it is thought that anything that could happen has happened an infinite number of times. There will be infinite worlds and infinite intelligent life forms, even infinite copies of ourselves. But we may also exist in an infinite universe, which is one of infinitely many universes, each existing in possibly infinite dimensions. We all explored the many theories and ideas as to where we all are in this immense system, which seemed to come from nothing in the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. New understanding says this may not be the full story. We look at the ideas and theories from a human perspective and hear from our best scientific minds, who spend their lives trying to understand these monumental concepts. How do we try and understand what may be simply beyond human comprehension? Are we the only life in the universe? Given that the universe is thought to be spatially infinite, then it would seem impossible that our world is the only world to have started life. If life exists elsewhere in the universe, then will we ever meet another intelligent race? Unfortunately, we have to go back to the sheer scale of the universe to realize that even our closest neighbors would take many light years to reach. Life could exist in so many forms that we would not even recognize it to be a living entity. Life might be so short-lived that it has come in and out of existence in less time than we can conceive of it. or so vast and old that it is part of the universe itself without us even knowing of its existence. Life could exist in different dimensions to ours and again we will never know of its presence. As humans, we yearn to know if we're the only intelligent life. But what would it mean if we did discover another superior life form? We consider ourselves to be sophisticated, intelligent beings. But to another more advanced race, we could appear to them as ants do to us. At the heart of all humans, is the fear of being alone. I hope there is more out there than just us, because otherwise it kind of makes us assume this big ego. And I think we have taken on this big ego of that we are all there is and we are all that will ever be. Maybe it's stupid that we are thinking that 
there only is one world where we are living in because it's infinity so maybe it's like thousands and thousands of miles away it's another world with other people on it and we cannot reach them or see them but maybe they're there in an infinite universe other life has of course got to exist everything has got to exist but whether there's other intelligent life out there, that becomes a much more difficult question. I, I believe that there's more than that we can see now. Maybe aliens, I don't know. Because we also popped up in once with the Big Bang, so they can also be on uh, other planets. And maybe they are hiding for us, you don't know, that they don't want to show them, so. We certainly are not the only form of life. We just can't be. Not when you look at the vastness of what is the cosmos. The universe is filled with stars and galaxies and, and supermassive black holes. The universe is filled with dark energy that we're not really sure what it is. Maybe dark energy is some type of alien that we haven't figured out what it is. And that all the aliens have evolved into dark matter virtual particles and they just fluctuate around and talk to each other and do whatever they do. And we just think it's the structure of the vacuum. In the 1960s, an equation was formulated to try to answer the question of the probability and frequency of contactable intelligent life in our galaxy. It was called the Drake Equation, and it predicted that there would be conservatively 4,000 planets with intelligent life in our galaxy alone. Since then, the estimate of this figure has increased by an amazing amount. What is our new understanding of the possibility that there is other life in our universe? I think the prospect of life out in the universe is, is reasonably high because the conditions here and the conditions out there are probably going to be quite similar. I mean, we would expect similar chemistry, we'd expect water, etc. It's probably tricky to get exactly the right conditions to get life going, so it's unlikely to be absolutely everywhere, but I wouldn't be surprised if there is other life around in our own universe. It would be uh, a kind of massive freak in a way if the only place where there was life happened to be here on Earth. If the universe is infinitely large, uh, then one of the things that can happen appears to be life. And so unless there's something really special about us, and there's really no physical evidence anyway that we're special, uh, then yes, intelligent life should exist elsewhere. Life perhaps more intelligent than us should exist elsewhere. If it really is spatially infinite, then I am certain that we're not alone. If it's spatially finite, I'm just almost certain that we're not alone. Almost certain why? Well, for all the usual reasons. Because there are plenty of planets in the Goldilocks zone. As we start to look for, for planetary bodies, every star we've looked at over the last decade has turned out to have planets around it. We've already discovered a few relatively close stars that have uh, planets in the roughly in the Goldilocks zone. And that's just from a tiny sample. So there must be very, very many of them in our galaxy. And our galaxy is only one of an incredible number of galaxies in the bit of the universe that we can see. So if nothing else, the sheer size of the universe makes it hard to imagine that we are the only example of intelligent life to date. And the more we improve our technology and telescopes, the more we can see. The vastness of the universe has only just started to reveal itself. 10,000 years ago, we, we had an Earth, we had the sun. We had other things in the sky, which appear to be stars. We didn't realize that those stars were actually new solar systems. And nowadays, we pretty much know that every star in the night sky has at least a planet, and if not more. So if our galaxy alone has 300 billion stars, there's probably at least 300 billion planets. So there's lots of planets out there. Even the finite universe that we see is vast. The number of stars in the sky, just in our one galaxy, is hundreds of billions. But then we realize 
but there's actually other galaxies that contain billions of stars, and those stars each have planets, and those planets each may or may not have life. So then we have a, a large thing which we call the universe, which has 175 billion galaxies with all these stars and all these planets. In the last decade, we have found so many alien worlds, exoplanets around other stars, that we can be pretty confident that on average, every star in the night sky has a planet. If you run the numbers, it's potentially four billion Earth-like worlds in our galaxy alone. So to say that ours is the only place that life has arisen is to take a four billion to one gamble. Now those, those odds seem pretty pretty steep, and I, I'm not a gambler. Even if I were, I think that might be a bit of a pun, a bit of a stretch too far. One of the variables in the Drake equation that has given the formula a lot of criticism is the number of times life starts on other planets. I don't even have to talk about infinite for life. I think with almost certainty that we are not alone, that there is life in our galaxy. It is a theoretical possibility that we are the only life in the universe, and we still don't know of any other life forms, no matter how crude. So is life starting on other planets a likely probability? or an incredibly rare occurrence. Recently, we analyzed data from the Kepler Space Telescope. We analyzed stellar systems that have multiple planets, and we predicted how many planets would be in the habitable zones around other stars. So when you look up at night, you will see a star our results tell us that there should be, on average, about two planets in the habitable zone. So that implies that there's a lot of real estate, a lot of things that are vaguely like the Earth, rocky planets with some water on it. So rocky planets with water on it are everywhere in the universe. Everywhere, probably an infinite number of them. And the carbon and water is everywhere. Amino acids are everywhere. Matter of fact, they're falling from the sky right now in carbonaceous chondrites. So the ingredients for life are, are everywhere, and not just in the origin of our Earth, but in the origin of all the Earths, the infinite Earths that I just referred to. But now comes the question, should we expect life there? Well, there doesn't seem to be an ingredient bottleneck, but maybe there's what you call a, a recipe bottleneck. Maybe there had to be some very unlikely coincidence of this coming into contact with this and then had to be sulfur spring going on here and then you have a tide going here and you had to dehydrate. In other words, such a complicated recipe in that it, life is very, very rare. And therefore, we don't see any aliens that have conquered our galaxy. I think life has to exist somewhere else. Now, firstly, we have to think of what life is. So. Bacteria, plants, animals, those are all life. I would say it, it's nearly guaranteed that some form of life exists in our own solar system right now. If you look at Titan, uh, the largest moon of Saturn, it has liquid ammonia, so it has rivers and lakes, essentially the ammonia. Now, we can't live off of that, but there's no reason you can't have something else that does. With Mars and the polar ice caps, I, I believe that we'll find evidence that life has existed at some point in Mars well within at least a decade, if not sooner. So that's just our little very, 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 very small clump of our galaxy, which is just one of the 175 billion. If you look at mathematically, it, it has to, has to exist. But how does life start? Some new ideas suggests that asteroids are like planet-seeding systems that carry the formula for life around the universe. But if that isn't the case, then chemistry evolved here on Earth in what has been termed the primordial soup. But we still don't know for certain. It seems unlikely that we are very, very improbable. 
And so the best guesses are that, is that there are many other civilizations in our galaxy. But you get back to the question, what causes life? We don't know. We don't know how life starts. But we do know that life started on our Earth fairly soon after the Earth cooled down, which suggests to you either life starts fairly easily or else there's some divine intervention. Again, all bets are off if there's a divine intervention. Life seemed to start on Earth as soon as the Earth cooled down. This does suggest that life is relatively easy to start. But this is a sample size of one. Until we confirm another life form, we still don't know for sure. Uh, life appears to have emerged here on Earth pretty much as soon as the conditions were even vaguely hospitable. So if life emerged so quickly on Earth, maybe it is simple for it to emerge elsewhere. I actually think life might be relatively easy to kickstart because we don't know the exact mechanism by which life arose. It's very difficult to put a number. My suspicion is it might not be as hard as we're thinking and potentially a lot of these habitable worlds could well be inhabited. Now, whether that life can communicate, whether it's intelligent life, again, it's just unknowable until we picked it. One of the exciting things with astronomy at the moment is that we're really legitimately looking now for life on other planets. And it's something that within a decade or so, there's a very good chance that we might be able to measure. And I'm not talking about listening for radio signals from aliens. What I'm talking about is looking at the atmospheres of planets that exist around other stars and looking for traces of life in those atmospheres, things like oxygen, which we know is unstable. If you have O2, then it has to be being created by something because it's very unstable. It will rust, it will burn, and it won't hang around for long. So if you can see something like O2 in the atmosphere, then something's producing it, and that thing could be life. Intelligent life is still one of the big questions for us to answer. As yet, all the searching we have done has only shown us what a vast, lonely place the universe appears to be. But other intelligent life could take many forms, and looking for versions of ourselves could be entirely the wrong approach. So we'd, we'd like to know how convergent human life is, or, how, or whether we should expect humanoids on other planets. For example, if there's an infinite number of, of life forms out there, what is their diversity? How different will they be from us? Some biologists think that they will be completely different. There's not a remote chance in hell of finding a humanoid out there like they do every week on Star Trek. Other biologists think that, no, there are convergent features that produces humanoids and produce an elephantoid or produce a dogoid and again and again and again. So if we go back 500 million years and then let it run again, we will find similar species again and again and again. Other biologists say, no, if you run the tape of life again, you will get very, very different things every time. So the branching of life is very uncertain. At any point, life could take a turn from one species to another. In another world, man may never have evolved past the ape stage. So what is the likelihood of another human species on another planet? How unlikely are we? Are we infinitely unlikely? I don't think so, but I don't know so. So the question is, how often is there life out there? There's reasons to go out and look for ET, because that would kind of prove it. On the other hand, it's worthwhile contemplating whether or not, you know, we might be it. And so that is a question we can go out and answer by literally looking at what's going on on other planets and seeing if there are signs of life, and then looking out and listening and seeing if we can hear the moral equivalence of ourselves. I don't know what the likelihood is of us finding something, the universe is very big, it's very hard for humans to even find ourselves. We've only existed for 100,000 years on a planet. And so that's like in a 24-hour day, two seconds in a 24-hour day. 
And of course, we've only been able to send radio signals and receive them for 40 or 50 years of, to any you know, degree at all. The human species is in its absolute infancy in terms of being able to be detected by other intelligent beings. The first signs that we existed were our first radio and television signals. Children, of course, love that too. Hi, Red Riding Hood. Where are you going? That's the brightest white for you. Every time I see you standing there before. These signals have only just begun in the time scale of the universe. The first strong radio signals that humans broadcasted, our first radio waves that have been going through space and traveling, have only reached 11,000 stars. And there are about 300 billion stars in our galaxy alone. And there's 175 billion galaxies. We haven't even touched a percent of a percent of a percent of a percent of communicating with these people. So even if they have just gotten a radio broadcast from the 1900s, they then have to return that signal back, so we're going to be waiting hundreds of years. And this is the problem. The vast distances of the universe make it impossible to communicate with even our closest neighbors. Unless another form of communication is discovered, then our efforts to communicate are unfortunately still in the science fiction realm. This, it seems, is like the ultimate tease, as our best science tells us that the universe must be full of other intelligent beings. The worry, of course, is that these things are so widely separated that we'll never meet these other creatures. So it might be that the universe is um, infinitely big, in which case there's going to be lots of civilizations that are just far, far too far away to ever get in contact with us, that, that you, you know, will be totally outside their, their light cone even. I see no doubt that every galaxy has at least one planet with intelligent life like us right now. So it's like 175 billion right there. But we're never going to be able to talk to these people, unfortunately. It's the same physics that we use to figure out that they're there tells us it's going to be too long to talk to them or travel to. Not to say that we can't figure out something new to do. But aliens may be much more advanced than us. They may have found a way to travel faster than the speed of light. So if they exist, why have we not heard from them? Is it possible that civilizations only exist for a short time? And therefore, finding an intelligent civilization in our neighborhood that is in the technological stage of its evolution is maybe just too rare, akin to finding a needle in a haystack. So maybe life on this planet has actually emerged at the earliest point that it could in our galaxy. In which case, why haven't we heard from anybody else? Because they've only just started as well. We've only been around for two million years out of four, four and a half billion years on this planet. So lots of planets could have had life at different times that we've never experienced or never will experience. Yeah, the universe is almost 14 billion years old. So you could have had advanced civilizations that live 1.3 billion years ago and have long disappeared. Maybe will disappear within a few hundred thousand years, the rate we're going, maybe much less. So I think life could be all through the universe but for a practical person, I'd ask a different question. What's the likelihood that we'll ever have contact with another form of life? That's a very different question. And that now gets us to the finite speed of light. Speed of light is not infinitely fast. So if you were to try to communicate to anyone within some distance, you wouldn't get very far. That signal would have to travel for thousands of years to have much chance of, of making contact with intelligent life. So you'd have to be around a very long time, maybe thousands, maybe tens of thousands of years as an intelligent race, advanced race, to have any chance of contacting these other forms of life. So there's two questions there. Does life exist throughout the universe? I'm sure it does. Is the life contactable? Could you make contact with it and communicate with it in a, in a reasonable time frame? 
being thousands of years, I think the chances are very, very small, if not zero. So communication seems impossible as yet. But what about travelling to the stars to discover new worlds? One obvious drawback to this idea is that our lifespan is simply too short. A trip to Mars, our local planet, will take four years. A trip to our closest star will take over 150 years. So again, still seems delegated to the science fiction realm for now. But anything is possible, given enough time in an infinite universe. We'll probably never experience another intelligent life form, unfortunately. So I believe that intelligent life form exists. Maybe it doesn't look like exactly what we think of in the movies, but maybe it does. Maybe they're identical to me and you. So perhaps life is a common occurrence in the universe. But what about human life? How rare could it be? And if not human life, what other kinds of diverse life could exist? How about human-like intelligence? If there's all this life elsewhere, they would surely get intelligent, build spacecrafts, and then colonize the entire galaxy. There's been plenty of time to do that. But we don't see spacecraft around here, or we don't see uh, alien signals when we l listen with the radio telescopes. Well, that might be that maybe human-like intelligence is not something that is a natural part of evolution. There are many millions of other species on this planet, and they are not evolving to become human-like. They don't want to become human any more than we want to become a, an elephant. Chimpanzees don't want to become humans. Humans don't want to become chimpanzees. There's a relativity there. There's not human superiority. And so humans are not uh, some type of convergent feature of evolution. So that might be to explain why we don't see all of these. There could be life everywhere, but it wouldn't be spacefaring. It wouldn't produce radio signals. Or maybe it does, but then they get so fancy, they build all kinds of bombs, have big wars, and they kill themselves. It's the self-destruction bottleneck. So there's many scenarios you can think of that are consistent with no visible aliens and lots and lots of habitable planets. Two billion years ago, we literally were amoebas and we evolved over two billion years into what we are today. So if you imagine that something similar happened on other Earth-like planets, and they have had two billion more years to evolve, then they're looking at us and they're thinking, hey, we're amoebas, you know, they wouldn't, and we don't even understand what, what they are, or we, no hope of talking. You don't talk to amoebas, and so uh, maybe that's the situation we're in, and that's why we think there's no other life form in the universe. What if life is everywhere in our universe, but it is so unrecognizable to us that we don't even realize it? Could life exist on such small quantum levels that we can never see it? Or such huge scales that, again, we could never perceive of it? Is it possible that there are, the universe is filled with aliens that we just don't know about because they are made out of dark energy, for example, or they communicate with neutrinos, or they communicate with radio wavelengths that are so long that we don't know about them? Well, you can easily imagine that, uh, you know, before 200 years ago, we didn't have radio communication, so imagine if the universe were filled of radio communicating civilizations, we wouldn't even know it until we invented the radio. This ditto for any other technology you can think of. But what if we did have communication with another intelligent life form? This has been the stuff of science fiction for the last century. And in most cases, the plots portray a fear of the unknown and war with the aliens ensues. Is this indicative of our likely behavior? Are all aliens to be feared? Or would we take a more intelligent, scientific approach? If there were conscious beings, then that would be such a threat to humanity because we have this assumed ego that we are all there is. Anything that is unknown is a threat to 
our stable, fragile existence. You know, and I think it would be vastly exciting to be able to try to understand life forms that were massively different to us. We've evolved in a very particular way, but other forms of life might have done something totally different, and, and that would be quite exciting if we could indeed wrap our minds around it. It's actually very difficult to get your head around what the possible implications would be of discovering and communicating with some other sort of alien life form. I think that people would be incredibly excited and it would change people's way of thinking about their lives and their role in the sort of the universe. While humans on Earth are kind of the top predator and we pretty much do what we like, whenever we like, and there are serious consequences arising from that. But nevertheless, uh, you've got to think we wouldn't be the top predator necessarily when we just start discovering other intelligent life forms. And, you know, it might turn out that things don't go entirely our way. The discovery of life, intelligent life somewhere in our universe, our galaxy, would be at once the most terrifying thought and yet most satisfying and relieving discovery simply because the burden of keeping this unique, wonderful phenomenon of life and all of its infinite variety and its possibilities is no longer ours alone to carry. An asteroid could come and wipe us out. The sun will one day eventually sterilize the Earth by expanding towards the end of its life. And right now that burden is on us and we're doing a terrible job of it. We are not very good custodians of this. But if there were aliens out there and they were intelligent and they were able to spread between the stars, then suddenly you would think, well, I guess it's not so bad that, it, that us humans are, are kind of dropping the ball on this, uh, this idea of trying to sustain life as a very beautifully weird and unexpected consequence of basic laws of physics and chemistry with infinite possibility, where the laws of physics are essentially boring and restrictive. From a scientific point of view, I would want to know what their science is, to see how theirs compares to ours. Do they describe electromagnetic radiation the same way we do? Do they know about the existence of electrons or whatever, you know? Is there something they're doing that we're not? I personally think that we've already detected life elsewhere and we just don't recognize it. Uh, and you do this by generalizing the definition of life. If you define life as a far from equilibrium dissipative structure, then you include fires and whirlpools and hurricanes as part of life. I think when we realize that, we will then consider we've already found life but that's a little bit of a mind bend. That's more of a mind bend than most people are, con are willing to uh, entertain. And so they're much more happy with thinking that maybe dark matter is aliens and that they have big brains and they talk English. What is life? This is a question that is surprisingly hard to answer. The definition of life has science divided, some going as far as suggesting the weather to be a form of life. What is the purpose of life, if there is one from an evolutionary point of view? Or is life purely a byproduct of random chemistry? I think life is the, well, you're not dead, obviously, but I kind of think that life is that you're breathing, but. I think that, oh my God, it's so hard. Um, I don't know, that's a difficult question. What is life? I believe life is about being a servant to other people. So I believe that this life on earth is just like a mini reflection of what we're gonna do in heaven for eternity. I think the meaning of life is the journey that you make of that life that gives that life meaning. Life matters because it's an adventure. For good or bad, there's always growth in life. 
And if, if we are infinite beings, we're infinitely growing and we're infinitely trying to have experiences that, that, that we benefit from. What is life? Life is something that we define here on Earth. It's hard to define. As a matter of fact, if you go to the biology department and ask biologists, are viruses alive? You know, half of them will say yes, and half of them will say no, and another third will say, huh. So we're not quite sure whether viruses are alive. And I take that as a warning signal, a big red warning signal, say, do we really know what life is? Because if you think viruses are alive, then they outnumber all other life forms on this planet. And if you think they're not alive, well, then you're excluding the thing that outnumbers all other life forms. When we think about life, we think about things that have properties that are kind of like us. So we're very good at detecting kind of middle-sized living things. Uh, we see elephants and we're pretty clear that they are kind of living things like us. And then we start to learn about things that are a little bit smaller. At some point we discover there are kind of molecules and bacteria. And they're a little bit more difficult to get your head around because they're so small and they're really very different from us, but we kind of, we manage it. But of course, there might be things that have lives just so radically dissimilar to us that it's hard for us to even recognize them as having lives. I'm a scientist, so I think there was some type of molecular evolution which led to autocatalytic processes, which led to rep replication, which led to some type of, hey, I'm going to preserve myself, and then et cetera, et cetera, Darwinian evolution. If you have that type of notion, then you have a way to at least hand-wavingly describe how non-life evolved and life emerged. Well, here's the thing. Where do you draw this boundary from non-life to life and if this evolved naturalistically, is there a boundary that we should put there and say, oh, this is life and this is not life? And I think the answer is no. It's a little like, you know, you have a mother and you hold your mother's hand and she holds her mother's hand. And, and Richard Dawkins pointed out that there's an, here's this train of mothers and going into the past. And if you go back four billion years, you're essentially having one bacteria hold another bacteria's hand, right? And so the question is, well, where in this chain do you cut it and say, here's a human being and here's a pre-human being? Therefore, you can't put a boundary and say, everything on this side is life and everything on this is non-life. That's a silly idea in the light of evolution. And I think we should get rid of it. Now we realize that actually the fundamentals, reason, the point for a lot of what we see around us, simply for that animal or organism to have more offspring. That's actually it. The meaning of life is self-replicating molecules. That's what life means. Life means molecules that manage to self-replicate and some subject themselves to evolutionary processes. I suppose that's what life is. Life is an incredibly complicated chemical reaction and the fact that you and I have the experiences that we do and have the lives that we do is all a massive byproduct of that fundamental, simple thing. Chemistry that locally creates order at the expense of globally creating more disorder. Our brains are a byproduct of an evolutionary pressure. In other words, to get smarter meant that you would have more babies, so there were more smarter babies. That drive has led us to these wonderful, adaptable, inquiring minds that have now unlocked so many of the mysteries of our universe. That, to me, gives a point to one's life, to inquire, to understand, to explore. Those give meaning, and our interactions with our friends and our family, those give meaning, that gives the point of life. The fact that from your genes perspective, they just want to replicate, they just want their particular set to go on. Okay, that's maybe the underlying drive and it certainly is when you're a basic organism like a bacteria, but as humans, we can do better and we often do. If you have an infinite number of rocky planets that are wet, you could have an infinite number of life forms. The problem is we don't know what that means. For example, no one can predict the direction of evolution. Or if you go back, rewind the tape of life on Earth, and let's say, hey, let's rewind the tape and let, let it play again. 
Would you get humans or would you get any of the species that you see today? That's a big debate in biology. Stephen Jay Gould said, no way would you get anything remotely close to being a human. Another guy, Simon Conway Mars, says, oh yes, you get some kind of humanoid because there are valleys in this uh, adaption space where, that, where each species lives and that would do it again and again and again. Our bodies are made from billions of atoms, which are all billions of years old. So the saying we are made from stardust is literally true. At the deepest level, we are the universe in human form. Ultimately, life emerged out of the universe. And so for me, before I go to bed most nights, I sit down, we have a hot tub, and I peer to the heavens, and I look up at the stars, I look at the Milky Way, I look at the galaxies that orbit our own, and I think of the dark spots between the stars where there are countless galaxies, and I realize just how rich the universe is, and how we are one small planet around one pretty ordinary star in one reasonably ordinary galaxy in a vast sea. And the fact that we're able to go through and contemplate and realize our place and how all this order works is amazing. It is to me the great amazing story for humanity and it intersects with, you know, philosophy and art just trying to come to terms with it. That's how humans are going to interact with that type of experience.